Welcome to the Lizzie Borden Podcast, Episode 24. I am your host, Stephanie Corey, filling in for the late Richard Barons, author of the Lizzie Borden Girl Detective series of mysteries. The Lizzie Borden Podcast is the only podcast entirely devoted to the study of the Borden murders of 1892, Lizzie Borden, and sometimes the history of her hometown, Fall River, Massachusetts. Produced by Nine Muses Books and Anna Behrens. Each episode explores some aspect of the mystery that is Lizzie Borden, from the origins of the doggerel, Lizzie Borden took an axe, to a primer on the case by noted authors and experts, including dramatic readings of Richard Behrens' Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Mystery Series. In this episode, we interview Bill Pavo, history teacher, author, former curator of the Lizzie Borden Bed and Breakfast, and close personal friend of the late Leonard Rebello. In this episode, we talk about Len Rebello, a remembrance of sorts, an honor for those who knew him. Len passed away on February 13th of this year. His fame in the Lizzie Borden world was tied to his monumental research book, Lizzie Borden, Past and Present, a Bible of Lizzie Borden studies. But Len was much, much more than this. And now, the Lizzie Borden podcast presents an interview with Bill Pavo. Welcome to the Lizzie Borden podcast. Today, we are honoring one of the Lizzie Borden kings. In fact, I would say the only king of Lizzie Borden, Len Rebello. Len passed away on Monday, February 13th of this year. He was only 76 years old. He had a master in special education and was a lifelong resident of Fall River. He was born to the late Alfred Rebello Sr. and the late Mildred Reed. He's also the brother of the late Alfred Rubello Jr. Len graduated from BMC Durfee High School and had a passion for learning and teaching, which led him to graduate from Curry College and Lesley University. When Len was attending college, he worked for many years in Phil's Barbershop in Fall River. He went on to become a learning disability specialist and reading therapist and received his Orton Gillingham training at the Reading Disabilities Unit at the Massachusetts General Hospital. As an educator, Lend worked with children in both public and private schools and earned several certifications. He had over 30 years of evaluating and diagnosing children with special needs and learning disabilities. He was an avid reader and history enthusiast and especially enjoyed exploring the history of Fall River. He's written and published several books, including what has been termed the Bible of Lizzie Borden studies, Lizzie Borden Past and Present. He also volunteered for many years in the emergency room at Charlton Memorial Hospital and enjoyed antiquing and going for daily walks with his friends. Len Rebello was a friend of mine Len was a friend of mine and a close friend of our guests today, Bill Pavo. And while this conversation is going to be about Len Rebello, our listeners would like to get to know our guest a little bit better. Hey, Bill. Hey, Steph. And your listeners. It kind of made me teary-eyed listening to Len's introduction. It was so, everything's so fresh. It's not only that. It was such a rich life. Oh, my God. So accomplished. Just listening to all that again, just hearing it, just People realizing how accomplished he was. People think of him as such a Lizzie Borden guy, but he was mm. he was like he was like a 40 percent Lizzie Borden guy and like a 60 percent educator. You know, he was yeah. he was all about teaching kids how to read that. That was his yeah. thing. Let me let me let's talk about you just for a minute and talk about your interest in the case and how you first met Len and how your relationship developed. And tell us a little bit about yourself. So 
I am a history teacher and I have been teaching in Quincy, Mass since 1998, teaching American history and government and civics, which I love. And, you know, I, I came into the Lizzie Borden case, I came to it when I was a kid watching the Elizabeth Montgomery movie. Just so funny, so many people, same experience. And I remember being a kid and being dropped off at the library on a Saturday and running in and looking up Lizzie Borden and finding uh, Sullivan's book, The By Lizzie Borden on the bookshelf and opening it up and looking at the pictures and going, oh my God, this was real. Because when I saw the movie, even though it runs at the end of the movie that Lizzie died and what happened to her, it still seemed kind of fictional. And then when you read it and see photos and crime scene photos, I'm like, oh my God, this is real. So one book led to another, led to another, led to another. And I remember in 1992, when they had the centennial in Fall River, sitting outside the Borden house going, I am going to get into that house someday. And I have pictures of myself sitting on the front steps. And little did I know that within four years, I would be the archivist after the house opened a few months later. And then a year later, I'd be the curator. And then I would live in the house. I, you know, from for two years, I lived in the the Second Street house from 1998 to 2000, and continued to be the curator there until it sold. And all the time, I was teaching, so I was a curator until 2004. And then um, when Christy Bates bought Maplecroft, you, Steph, introduced me to Christy Bates. I thank you for that. Always, I'm always grateful because that was a wonderful experience, you know. And she said, "Oh my God, I'd love for you to be the curator here." And I said to her, when she offered that, I said, you know, is, would you consider letting Len Robello be the co-curator? Because, you know, I said, this is this would probably be his last hurrah in Lizzie. And I know that this would mean so much to him. And, you know, over the years, I tried so hard to get him reinvigorated in Lizzie, like to redo his book. or And he would start a little bit. And I think the task was just so overwhelming, like to redo his book or whatever and put it out again. Um, but Maplecroft was the golden opportunity. And the time that we were there for over a year, he loved it. So I'm lucky. I'm so blessed that for someone that was interested in the case, and I'm not interested in, in any way for ghosts and spirits, um, or anything supernatural. I have zero interest in that. I am absolutely a historian. Um, I come at the, at the case through the lens of history. And I, I'm so lucky that I got to not only be in the house, but be the curator and live in the house and make an impact on what was being presented to the public during that time period from the house. Because again, I'm an educator. So I saw that as an extension of educating people. Did you help them decide about the interior decorations and the, you know, the way the house looked to re restore it to its period? No. no, not at first, not at first, because they had another curator. Um, so it wasn't until after he had uh, left yeah. the Second Street house that you know, at that time, I was becoming really good friends with with Len Rabello, and he and I literally were taking the trial and reading through it and going room to room to room in that house and removing things that didn't belong in those rooms or moving things that were in the wrong rooms and putting them in the correct rooms oh, wow. and going out antiquing. You know, that was one thing that he and I did together for years that we loved because, you know, we both loved history. You know, my passion was his, is history. So at that point, we absolutely had an impact on the way that house was arranged. Now, we didn't change any wallpapers or carpets, but okay. we definitely moved furniture. <laughs> we got rid of a lot of knickknacks that were in the house that didn't belong there, put furniture where it belonged in its historical spot, you know, yeah. where it was in 1892 at the time of the murders. So we definitely made a difference. Yeah. We absolutely did. And the same with Maplecroft, you know, Christy Bates was amazing to work with. You know, she did a lot of decorating of the house on her own. And luckily that house, you know, not, I guess I shouldn't say luckily, you know, that house 
we don't know a lot about the interior of maple crops. We kind of had an open window there to be able to make it the way we thought it might look based on some evidence, which was pretty scant. Um, but we had an impact with that too. And even though that house never opened to the public, we still had the impact. Right. You know, we, it was prepared to be opened. We could have opened it, you know, if it had, if things had worked out differently. You'd even gone so far as to write a tour script, right? Yep, for both houses. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Len and I did the tour script for both houses wow. that we used. That was used while we were there. Once we were gone, that the the tour wasn't used anymore. Oh wow! So I'm sure that the tour it. the tour focused on telling the story of the history of the times and the era and the family. I yep. mean, I remember you writing. Wasn't it you that wrote the article for the Lizzie Borden Quarterly on Abby Borden? Yes. That she had been sort of neglected as a character in this story, and we didn't know much about her until you did a lot of research on her? Yeah, no one had ever written anything really about Abby. It was almost like she was a tangent, like on a tangent, she was a tangential character, yeah. like just, yeah. you know, she's just a victim. And not much was said about her. So, yeah, that was uh, quite a while ago. That was probably back in, I don't know, in 1995, 96. Something yeah, because like the that. Lizzie Borden Quarterly started in 92, right at the conference, I guess. It was yeah, published so, through Bristol Community College. Yeah, so that was cool. It actually may have been a little bit later because I remember being at uh, my former school building when that was published, possibly. So, Say around 1997 or six or something that came out. So, yeah, I that was a great article. I loved it. Like, I'm not saying because I wrote it, but because it was <laughs> nice. To, yeah, no, I'm not that, I'm, you know, I, I tend to be more. Oh, humble. but it was good. It influenced a lot of people. I mean, I never found out how many people actually subscribed to the Lizzie Bourne Quarterly, but I do recall myself and my sister, as well as other people we knew, couldn't wait until a new issue came out. So that yeah. we could pour over, because it was the only place to get research. I mean, this is before right. the internet, basically. Right. So getting research from people who are on the ground, like yourself and Len, and he wrote for the Lizzie Borden Quarterly as well, periodically, yes. and yeah. discovered Several things. Times. Yeah, it was how people got to know who he was also from a distance right. that way. How did yeah. you actually meet Len? I mean, was it he popped into the house or... Yep. 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 Showed up one night at the Lizzie Borden house. And uh, so I met him and, you know, we would sit and talk and he would, you know, come in and out. And uh, he was writing his book at the time. And he said, well, you need to come up to my house and uh, we'll talk about the book. So I went up to his house and I'll never forget sitting in his kitchen and the book was on the table and it was just a pile about a foot high of printouts from his <laughs> printer. And sitting in that kitchen, surrounded by paintings of fruit and uh, <laughs> <laughs> lots of fruit, these, yeah, lots of fruit. And you know, at first he would say, "So, what do you want to know?" And one of the things I asked him was, "What was the correct color of the house?" And he was kind of hesitant to tell me at first because he's like, "You know, who is this young guy?" You know, because at that time I was probably like, I don't know, twenty six, twenty seven years old. So he was like, you know, who is this young guy? And uh, I'll never forget that. And then after a while, he really got to know me. He really trusted me. And he opened his entire archives to me. He let me photocopy anything I wanted. I actually went and got a little photocopier and put it in his bedroom. So it was like next to his desk because he had, you know, in his bedroom, his bedroom was like one side. And then the other side of that room was his desk and kind of his office area. So on that side, I put a little photocopier and he would be at his desk and I was at the photocopier and he could not have been more generous. And one of the things I know that he appreciated with his book, especially was that I looked at it through the eyes of a historian and it's like he needed that. He needed somebody that with a, a history background because I looked at the book differently and I he'd show me something. I go, oh, you got to put that in there. <laughs> oh, you got to put, I'd be like, you got to add that. Like uh, when he originally wrote the book, there weren't going to be any photographs. It was going to be all sketches. He wanted people to be able to see what it, what the people in 1892, 93 were seeing. 
And so I talked them into putting photos and there were no maps, no floor plans. So we did all those together. Um, the timelines that are in the back, we did those together. The one that he did more on his own mostly was uh, Andrew's last walk in life. But he used to tease me, like, you know, Bill, you added 200 pages to this book. <laughs> and he would say that in interviews. He'd say, yeah, in this one, added 200 pages. But I always would say those were the best 200 pages, though. And he would laugh. But I was so proud of him. And I was so proud of that book. And he was so happy when that book came out. He was you know, Part of it is oh, you work. he's working on something for so long all by himself. And to have someone that's interested and as interesting as you are, take a look at his sort of secret research, you know, where he hasn't yep. shared it with anybody yet. It hasn't been published yet. Right. And to have another human being say, this has value. Right. That that validation is so important to an author. It's it's a scary moment to hand your work over to somebody and say, well, what do you think? And because they could say, are you kidding me? You know, or this isn't anything or uh, nobody's going to want to read this. But your reaction was probably the spark that helped him continue on because he realized he had something there. Oh, yeah. He, I, I knew that when I saw it, it was just brilliant. And it was what people needed, because up until then, when people were doing research on the Borden case, you know, he documented everything and people weren't doing that at that point he really changed the way people looked at the boarding case because now you couldn't just say this happened because the question would be well where'd you get that you had to state where you were getting your information and he was not a trained historian you know he taught himself this he taught himself the research skills that he had and he was a consummate researcher he did all this before the internet and before Ancestry.com and online databases yep. and and digital yep. deeds and legal documents and blogs and n newspapers that are online. He had he yep. did all this from scratch. Can you imagine or can you recreate or relive for us what it must be like to do these this kind of legwork? And do you recall? the particular places and the sources he used and how he figured out where he needed to go to get what he needed to get the information that he was looking for. He was always looking for clues of where to go, always looking for the next step. But, you know, he went as far as Montana when he was searching Bridget Sullivan's life. I mean, he literally went to Montana where she lived um, and interviewed some folks that knew her. He spent a lot of time at the branch of the National Archives on Trapello Road in Waltham, because that's where you would get the census records for the whole country. And before the internet, that's where he was. And I know that because that's where I was at the same time, but I didn't know him and I was researching my own family history. So he and I like bonded over that too, because we knew how to research. We were both in a lot of ways self-taught, even though, you know, I was, a, you know, a schooled historian. Um, he and I just kn knew where to find things and we would both be excited to go out and do it. So he was going to any archives he could get to. And it was all by foot. One of his cousins told me that Len used to take him when he was a little boy, to, uh, if they were going out in Boston, Len would say, hey, I just have to stop at the Boston Public Library to look at something. And he would bring his cousin down into the archives and Len would do whatever he had to do and then they'd leave. So, and that that's so him, you know, hey, hold on, I just want to check one thing, you know, but, and he spent a lot of time at the Fall River Public Library, the New Bedford Public Library. That's yeah. where he was reading all these newspapers on microfilm. And he was photocopying all the entries that he needed for his research. You know, today it's online. I, I remember showing him like newspapers.com. He couldn't believe it. He just kept saying, God, if I had only had this when I was doing my book. But he was doing it all before it was online. So his book was a labor of love. It was a labor of love, for sure. Absolutely. 
And that's why they call it the Bible. I mean, it's yeah. It's also known as the Rebello, which I think is fitting. You know, do yeah. you, where are you going to look it up? Well, I'm going to look it up in my Rebello. It's not Lizzie Borden past and present. It's yeah. the Rebello because that is his. Without the Rebello, there would be no book. There's there's nobody else who was thinking along those lines back then. No. In terms of research. Yeah, he's and, so and, unique. In a way, he elevated, like you were saying, he elevated the case to an historical study as opposed mm -hmm. to a sort of blood and guts slasher, true crime, unseemly violent act. He mm -hmm. wasn't interested in that. He was interested in the history of the people, the place, and the location of everything births and deaths, what was going on and what it must have been like to live back then, not right. the crime itself. Right. Because that has been written about a thousand times in a thousand different directions and no one will know the answer. And he wasn't really striving to learn who killed who. Was he? Uh, he definitely had his opinions, but he he was interested in the history. He wasn't interested in the sensationalism right. that has, you know, been following the Borden case, you know, since 1892. He really wasn't interested in that at all. He was interested in it as a historian. He saw them as real people. And, you know, that's one of the ways that he and I bonded because we both came at this case like that you know we saw the house as being a home where real people lived you know we saw the borns as real people and you know we weren't into the 40 wax and all that because you know when it comes down to it you know on august 4th two people died a really horrible death and it was very violent and they deserved the respect that i know that you know that len was giving them and that yeah. I was trying to give them as well yes. it, at the house. It, it, there, it was all about the history, respecting these people and being curious about their lives. Right. And, and sort of walking away from the fun and games side of it, because yeah. it's not fun and games because it's a very serious subject. Right. No. And even at the, at the beginning, you know, when Ron Evans and Martha McGinn owned the house, you know, we weren't allowed to even have a hatchet in the house at that time. So it was about the history. And so that's one of the reasons that you know, like Ron and Martha loved that Len and I were coming into the house because we weren't interested in reenacting the case and being gruesome or anything like that. Right. That wasn't our interest at all. Right. It's so important because it, a self-taught historian is an amazing thing because they want to get it right. They want to get it so right that they go a thousand extra miles in order to make that happen and check and double check and triple check right. in order to be accurate, as accurate as they can possibly be. And, right. and for instance, um, he had a really interesting discovery in his book about the location of the Whitehead House on 4th Street, mm -hmm. where Abby's half-sister and stepmother lived. And mm -hmm. it was the sale of this house that was really important to the story of the family, because according to some historians, it caused the rift in the family that led Lizzie to cease calling Abby Borden mother and began referring to her as Mrs. Borden, um, even though Emma had always called her Mrs. Borden. So do you know how that detective work was carried out and i i think he i think he told you all about that and what he had to do to find the details of where that house actually was he was so excited when he found that i i will actually never forget how excited he was because that he could bring me and show me you know he's like william he, was, he always said william you know if he was talking <laughs> about me to someone he would say bill you know bill called or bill came over or, or, I or bill and i went and did this 
Um, but if he was talking to me, it was always William. And he'd go, William, we, I got to show you something. And I remember him take, getting me in the car and drove over and he showed this to me. He goes, this is the house. So I know that he traced that using deeds. Right. The deeds they were there. So yeah. hard to decipher. Yes. Yeah, but he did it. And so he was so excited about that. Like That's one thing that he found and that was unique to him, you know, that he was the one who discovered that. And he was so proud of what he brought to the Borden case, because as an educator, he saw his book as a way to teach people. Absolutely, because that's just him. You know, he's just an educator. That's it was his heart and soul. And print above the couch where Andrew mm -hmm. was killed but by mm -hmm. Bellows. Is that the man's name? Bellows? Yeah. Isn't it Albert Fitch Bellows? Albert Fitch Bellows, who has a Fall River connection, by the way. But he found the name of the print. And of course, yeah. Borden people all over bought it because of that. I mean, when he right. found the name of it, and I think he put it in the LBQ, the Lizzie Borden yep. really did an article about it. Everybody rushed out and had to get yep. this print and have it framed and have it in their house because that was the print that was above the murder scene. Yep. And yep. He, he figured it out. He actually had talked to someone that had a copy of that print. And so that's how Len made the connection. Once he saw it, he realized that that really was what was hanging over the couch um, because that's not what was there. When I first came to the house, there was a painting hanging there called The Picnic. And I remember buying a copy of it and laying it out on my dining room table and looking at the crime scene photo and going, this doesn't really match exactly. And whenever Len found that, he even went out and bought a print of it uh, because he wanted one too. So he got a print of it for the Borden house. So that's the print that's hanging there right now. Oh, wow. So that, he, that print that's hanging there fits the same. Uh, we took that down to a framer and they took the picnic out and put the accurate print in. Wow. And so it's been sitting there, or hanging there rather since then. Wow, that's a long time. He used to love going over to the bed and breakfast in the evenings also, right? To meet visitors and to sign his books. Um, yep. I was lucky enough to enjoy one of those visits myself. And I think that maybe how I met him personally for the first time, he would sit and sort of hold court in a very generous manner. He would sit and you could ask him questions and he would answer them. And I think that anybody who experienced these kind of impromptu Len Rebello visits was the, was super lucky. Were you still working there when he used to come there in the evenings yes. to talk to people? And yep. can, you, can you recall any kind of sort of special moments when that happened? I mean, he, he loved it. He loved, like you said, holding court because he loved being the center of attention like that when it came to Lizzie because people would come in. And they thought they were getting something really special because yeah. it was the author of this book. And I remember the book was $50 and people would be like, oh my God, 50 bucks. Cause then, you know, the book came out in 1999. So then 50 bucks for a book was a lot, you know, now, you know, for a special book, you know, people would play that. But back then that seemed to be a lot. And, you know, he would come in and people would buy it because he would sell them on the Borden case. He wasn't trying to sell books when he came in. That wasn't his goal at all. Um, but if people were buying his book, he would sign it and, you know, he would write, you know, signed at the scene of the crime. And he would also take people in his car and he would show them around Fall River. He'd drive them through the cemetery. He loved doing that he did but that he with me he did that with me and perry widows and my sister we got in his yeah. car and he just showed us everything yeah he just loved it he just loved it and he gets me teary-eyed because again he's only been gone for about six weeks and you know he was like my dad so i uh i miss him yeah he's he's someone to be missed and he'll always be mm -hmm. missed it's and i don't say that lightly no. at all 
it's no. it's hard to wrap my mind around him not being there really hard because he's such a presence and such a yeah. uh, indomitable uh, spirit in yeah, as a friend he was a really yeah. great friend um yeah i'm still trying to figure out how do i do this thing called life yeah without him yeah. i'm sorry he was also really humble about it. I mean, yes. while he sat there and enjoyed being the center of that, he was also really sort of, he was of another era. He was of a kind of a polite society era. Mm -hmm. I remember him, I remember him telling me about certain behaviors that I would have. And he would say, now Steph, that's not very ladylike, or that's not what you're supposed to do. And I'd be like, wait, what era are you living in? What what right. decade are we talking about here? And he would be amazed when we would go grocery shopping and he'd see a woman who was dressed up in the grocery store. He'd say, now that's the way people should dress. Right. You know? No pajama mamas. We need, we need a lot, a lot of people to yeah. dress up like they used to. So he had this sort of and I don't know if it's 50s or 60s or whatever. It almost is from before that. It's almost like he lived right. in the Victorian era in his own mind. Right. And his sense of propriety and was connected to the case in that direction. And so right. he would he would be humbled at the same time he would be proud. I don't know how else to describe it. I mean, he he was sure. proud of his work, but he was humble about the the gratitude and the compliments that he got for his work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, he would yeah, he was never vain. There was not a single ounce of vanity in him at all. He knew that he was doing that to help people, but he was really proud of the fact that he did elevate the case in as much as people then began documenting where they were getting information. Yeah. And where he got that from, he credited uh, Betty Mitchell, who taught a course at, I think, BCC, where he took a course on the Borden case. Was it Curry College, wasn't it? I don't think it was Curry College when he took that course. I'll have to look because I think I have the book okay. that he used. Um, I'll have to look on it. I thought it was at... at I thought it was local, but the the professor was uh, Betty Mitchell, if I'm not mistaken. Believe. Yes, no, it was. And he said that when you wrote papers for her on the Borden case, you had to document where you were see, seeing that information. You couldn't just say, uh, Lizzie did it. You had to really explain and document where you were getting it. And that's who he credited for making him think that way. Mm-hmm. And that's why his book was the way it was. It really originated from that course. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when I published the uh, the Hatchet Journal after the Lizzie Borden Quarterly went defunct, I carried on with that tradition as well, with everything had to be sourced and footnoted. And yeah. had you had to tell me where you got this from and vet right. it. We vetted every article. And it's it was really important. It, it, you know, I would have an author every once in a while who would say, "Oh, um, it, it, I got it from Rebello," and I'd be like, "Okay." So I spent an entire day trying to find the source in Lynn's book. Could not find the source, and went back to the author again and said, "It's not in there." And that person said to me, "Oh, I must be from a newspaper somewhere." I'm like, "Eh, no, that's not the way we play this game." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you can't tell me where you got that from, then we're Xing it out of the article because it's 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 not it has no value. It's as if you right. made it up. Right. So yeah, that's just that's just the way historians work. Um, I right. know about his excitement of new discoveries. I was with him uh at Wheaton College when we were investigating Emma's education there. And going through all the records and touching all the books and finding out how much Andrew paid for Emma's education. And, and then looking around Swansea with him, we spent more than one day in their archives of the Historical Society discovering 
Emma Borden's photo albums of her family mm-hmm. and the Morse family and him holding up a picture and said, doesn't this look like her? <laughs> is it, doesn't this look like John Morse? Look at who this is. Cause some of the pictures were not marked, but they were in a photo album that belonged to Emma Borden. So yeah. he and I also had some really fun times doing some discovery work together. And I think yeah. he was just like a kid. He was so happy. He was so, so happy cool. to be involved in all of that and 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 be able to share that experience with somebody else. Even though I know he did most of his work solo, but he also liked working with others too. He did. Yeah, he did. I remember when Parallel Lives came out. Yeah. And I told him, I said, I, you are not buying that book. I am going to get that book for you. Yeah. So I went to the Historical Society and got a copy for him and a copy for me. And I went right to his house. And I remember him going to the page with the pictures of older Lizzie and seeing his face, seeing pictures of her for the first time and the excitement and him really examining the photos and really looking at her and the smile on his face, like he just loved it. He just loved it. But, you know, he was the type of guy too, like, you know, like he loved life, really. He just, he just loved it. He was so happy with the Borden case and studying and finding things and everything that we wrote for the Borden house and Maplecroft, the tours, everything was documented that had never been done before on the, their tours, like where every single thing that we said to the public was documented, where that came from. So if anybody ever asked a tour guide, you know, I never heard this, where where, am I, where can I read that? They could literally go to a printed copy of the tour and tell them mm-hmm. where it came from and what page. Um, again, it's a teaching tool. We saw the houses as teaching tools. Well, he's an educator, first and yeah. foremost. First Absolutely. and foremost. And Absolutely. that's there was he's so much more than Lizzie Borden and his yeah. life as a special education teacher. I mean, mm-hmm. what how many 30 years at Norton? Over, yeah, over 30 years teaching. And then after he retired, tutoring. Yeah, at Diamond. Yeah, at Diamond. And he just loved teaching. He loved the connection. He loved making a difference. Uh, I mean, he was even teaching the Orton Gillingham program during COVID. And he was working so hard to figure out how to do that. I remember. I remember. You need to see people's mouths when they're pronouncing words because you're teaching them um, pronunciation, correct pronunciation, and sounds of vowels and sounds of, of letters. And how frustrated he was because he couldn't be closer to the kids to see their models really well. He And they had to figure out a way to put plexiglass between him, he and the kids so he could have them take their mask off and he could take his mask off so that they could see his mouth and how he pronounced letters and words. Um, he didn't just walk away from that and say, well, it's COVID, I'm not going to do this. This is too difficult. He figured out how to do it as frustrating as it was for him to get it right. He stayed with it. Um, Just like he wrote the 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 book on the Lizzie Borden research case. He's also written the book on Orton Gillingham reading with the word finder. Yeah. Four different books on Orton Gillingham. But the word finder is like a Bible for Mm -hmm. teachers teaching Orton Gillingham. And it's still in publication. Yeah. And he, he he did everything the best. I remember him working on the Orton Gillingham book over and over and revising it, revising it, revising it. And he goes, Steph, I need to, you know, turn this into a PDF. And I would go over and help him with his uh, logistics of the computerization of getting things on a disc and building his website and getting this out into the world. And it, he would he'd spend every night going over it again and again and again and saying, oh, there's improvements that need to be here. And he would make changes or he would we'd be at a bookstore and he'd buy another book on how the mind works, you know, mm-hmm. and words, books on words. And then he would incorporate this new knowledge into his own work and have another revised edition. 
And it was it was a never ending process. And he so enjoyed it. He wanted it to be the best it could possibly be. But not for himself. It was always for other people. Right. To help. Yeah. To spread knowledge. Yep. Absolutely. And to help kids read. Yeah. Absolutely. He was so passionate about helping kids read. And we're talking high school kids. Yes. Who can't read. And he's getting them at the high school level and changing their lives. He would tell me about being in like the grocery store and some student would walk up to him. It's like, Mr. Robello, do you remember me? And he did. He always remembered them. Yep. Yeah, because he worked, you know, one on one with so many kids over the years that, you know, he would build these connections with them. So, so many of them he did not forget, you know, and he would have kids coming up to him. You know, he'd be at Dunkin Donuts (laughs) getting coffee and somebody would come up to him. And, you know, it was just so touching. You know, even I mean, you had that story about that gentleman at his at his uh, wake. That said that Len changed his life. Yes. Yeah, I mean, and he became uh, he's now an Orton Gillingham trainer himself because of Lynn. And he was his student yeah. who didn't know how to read. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he went right. all the way to it being his career yeah. because he met Mr. Robello. Mm. It was such a good story. He was just standing there in the back of the room and I'm like, hi, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> and then this story gushed out and it was perfect. It was a perfect story. I wish he could have gotten up in front of everybody and told it because it was such an important part of who Lynn was. Yeah, it's lovely. His had lots of friends and, and he was his circle of friends was very eclectic. Because mm-hmm. he was born and raised in Fall River, he had what cousins galore? Is that easy to say? He had lots when of when he cousins. was growing up. Yeah, when yeah. he was growing up, not now as much, but when he was growing up, for sure. Yeah, he had family that way, sideways. Mm-hmm. Um, he had uh, friends in education uh, that taught with him for 30 years in Norton and at Diamond. He had the Lizzie Borden people. He had cousins and high school pals that he still hung around with. And those he walked with in the mornings one of his oldest friends he used to work with at the shoe store yep. in Somerset back when he was what 20 yeah like Just about. yeah so he and these friendships lasted his entire life he right. wasn't a he 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 had lasting relationships with people and i think that that's right. that's a testament to a person's character and the amount of time he spends with people, right. you know, as a listener or doing things with them. And I don't know how many people he helped older friends that were at end of life stages and he would help them and go visit mm-hmm. them and bring them things and make sure things were taken care of. I mean, he was a, a really a true friend and he was. Of course, everyone has multiple facets to their personalities, but it seems to me that this is a man whose loss will be deeply felt by everybody who knew him. And I think he was a rare individual. Absolutely. He was a true, a true, true friend. He And he would do things for people. He never expected anything in, in return ever. And he would just do them. He would just go and help people if he thought they needed it, um, help people whose families were struggling, help people whose relatives were sick. Um, you know, I, he was the one person that it, no matter what I could count on, if I needed something, I could call him, say, Len, I need a ride to the doctor or I need that. And never a question. He would just do it. Yeah. It was never an imposition, nothing. Um, he, you know, one of his friends had cancer several years ago and he would drive her every day for treatment from Fall River to Boston and back every day so she could get treatment because her family was working. I mean, he, and he never complained, never batted an eye. 
I think he really liked to drive too, because his antiquing was like his passion. That was his, right. his secret, not his secret, but his private passion, because he liked to, he was always on the hunt for the thing that he was looking for. And he would go back to these antique shops again and again and again until the yep. price came down a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. Yeah. And he would take me to some places and he'd say, well, here's a Mary Macumber. What do you think of it? And I said, oh, that's an ugly thing. I'm sorry. I don't yeah. like that one at all. He goes, yeah. well, I was thinking of getting it, but I think I think you're right. I don't think it's that attractive. I don't think it's one of her better paintings. And, you know, he was quite the connoisseur. He was... Yeah. An, he was into the Fall River School of Art. Absolutely. Ah, uh, he wrote about it. He mm -hmm. researched it to the end of his days. Yep. Lectured he, on it. Yes. Lecture. I saw a lecture of him doing that in Swansea mm -hmm. on the Fall River School of Art. Yep. He, Mary Mac Humber was a personal favorite of yep. his. Yep. So so you you look at somebody in their totality, and he's this. Very rich, eclectic, interesting person who there there are no words. There's just no words. I don't know anybody else like him. So no, mm -hmm. I, well, I I just don't. Is there anything else you'd like to add to the Len Rebello story that? we've missed or that you think our listeners would enjoy hearing maybe end on a, a, a sort of something upbeat or happy that because I've I'm, I'm been kind of a downer myself right now about it. No, because it's still so fresh. It's still so sad. But, um, you know, to me, his legacy is so important. And, you know, his public legacy, of course, yes. is educating, not just I mean, and educating people through his Lizzie writings his Lizzie research uh, through Orton Gillingham, his teachings, um, you know, to me, his legacy is more personal. It's all of th those things, of course, but he's also, you know, again, he's like my dad. Yeah. So to me, that's his legacy. And, you know, I really take it very seriously that I want to make sure his legacy is uh, remembered uh, because he deserves to be remembered because he was a special person. Yes. I like, I like that. He deserves to be remembered. He does. 100%. I don't want to see him forgotten and everything that he did because I saw how hard he worked. You know, I worked with him for on the end of his book for two years and I watched how hard he worked and how excited he was when the books finally came. And, you know, filling up a storage <laughs> unit. Oh my God, when the books arrived, they were all in boxes of fives. And he, I think he had 1,800 printed. Oh, wow. And they were all brought to a storage unit that he had rented that looked like a garage. And he and I had a dolly and the the truck dropped off the books on pallets. And so he and I had to move all those books into his storage unit. And they were literally packed floor to ceiling right to the edge of the front. And every once in a while, you know, as books sold, for the historical society or the bed and breakfast, he would go down and raid his storage unit. <laughs> and, you know, it would be a little less and a little less and a little less until finally, you know, the storage unit was empty and, you know, his books are, you know, now collector's items as they should be. Um, and he paid you know, to publish his own book. I mean, he 100%. published a hardback book yep. back when paperbacks were a lot cheaper. So he created right. a quality book. Right. And unfortunately for him, I mean, he was really upset about this. I have to say that, you know, so if people are reading his book and they see typos and stuff, his book had been edited several times. And the very last time that we got galleys for his book and the way that we got those galleys is that we were handed the, you know, the galleys of the printed copies of what the book should look like. And he gave sections to different people to edit. And so we had to highlight where the errors were and what the correction should be. And I remember him handing that in. And when the book came out, the edits that we had all found it hadn't matched the final printed book. So I want to make sure when people read his book, if they pick up errors, that those are things that were caught 
by us and by him that that was not his intention. He didn't put a book out because he was a perfectionist. Yes, yes. And I know that that bothered him greatly that there were these little errors uh, throughout, little typos or whatever. Um, that, that was not the way he wanted it. But regardless, he was so proud of that book. And I was so proud of him. You know, he would, and he was so generous. Like he would go on the, the radio doing a, do a, a show about his book. And he would invite me, he would invite Ed Tebow uh, to go with him because he would tell me later, he'd say, you know, I didn't want Ed to be left out. You know, that's just him. Yeah. Yeah, it gets me choked up just thinking about it. Yeah. Well, we've lost a lot of really wonderful people. Oh, um, God, yeah. Lizzie is a supremely excellent matchmaker. I have met some of the most important people in my life through Lizzie Warden. Yes, you too, Bill. Um, my yeah. boyfriend, you, Glenn, Harry Widows, the list, Terrence Donahoe, the yeah. list goes, Maynard Bertolette, um, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. There's just so many people that we've lost, but they're all uh, real people and serious people. And that's all about that's because of Lizzie Borden that we all had that historical interest in the case. Yep. Yep. I'll forever be grateful. Yeah. For the me Borden too. Case. Yeah, always, me too. always be grateful because it changed my life. Yep. Me you know, too. It really changed my life. You know, I got to do writing articles. I got to not just be a history teacher, but actually work with objects in a house as a historian um, you know, I met so many amazing people that changed my life. Uh, I got to live in the house. I get to do television at different times. And oh yeah, you're the Billy Borden and that uh, that was Billy Borden, yeah, the original <laughs> Billy Borden. I was, yeah, yeah, it's so funny. Um, yeah, I was a good Liz I was a good Billy Borden. I you were a great that. Lizzie Borden. You had the you had you were very scary, Liz Billy Borden. Yeah, I should. Yeah, I needed an Emmy for that one. I think <laughs> they they missed out. But it's all good. No, but, you know, in all truthfulness, I'm always grateful for the case because I, you know, I love the case, you know, even though I'm not actively involved, you know, now in Lizzie, I'm sort of like retired from Lizzie, but I still love it. Still love the case. I'm just not active in the houses anymore. You know, I, I just met so many amazing people had such a great time with it. Loved it. Still love it. Most importantly, my buddy Len. I mean, seriously, you know, and I keep I keep waiting to get a sign from him because he, anytime someone would pass away <laughs> that was related to the Borden case, he'd say, wait, we just got to get a sign. They got to send us a sign who killed the Bordens. Right. So, now you know, they know. Um, now they know. Now they know. And, you know, now he knows. And I'm waiting for the sign. Okay. Still. Well, well, you will tell me when, when, yeah. when, if you hear it, because yeah. that will be an experience i'm sure even if it's in a dream bill even if it's in a dream yeah yep yeah i'm waiting for the sign from them thank you so much no thank, thank you, you so much i know this it's means... a tender time i know it's still yeah. a tender time and i so appreciate you talking about len and sharing your memories because yep. no thank you think no, the world you. needs to know what a great guy he was and absolutely important and, he was. That was the reason to do it is for him. You know, I loved him. I I'm going to miss him uh, forever. So, yeah. you know, I'm glad. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Thank you for listening to the Lizzie Borden podcast, episode 24. We've been talking to Bill Pavo about the great Len Ravello. It is a sad time for those who knew and loved him. And at such a tender time of mourning, we thank Bill for this informative and important discussion. Find Richard Barron's Lizzie Borden Girl Detective stories at Amazon.com and at LizzieBordenGirlDetective.com, where you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Listen to more Lizzie Borden podcasts on our website or on Podbean, Audible, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, and YouTube.